This episode of Eat the Rules is brought to you by You on Fire. You on Fire is the online group coaching program that I run that gives you a step-by-step way of building up your self-worth beyond your appearance. With personalized coaching from me, incredible community support, and lifetime access to the program so that you can get free from body shame and live life on your own terms. Get details on what's included and sign up for the next cycle at summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. I'd love to have you in that group. This is Eat the Rules, a podcast about body image, self-worth, anti-dieting, and intersectional feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth, and confidence, and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 206, and this is another segment in the movement series, a series of podcast episodes to help you change your relationship to movement. In this episode, I'm giving you eight ways to heal your relationship to movement. You can find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 206. First, I want to give a shout out to Liz App, who left this review, Summer in and In's podcast is brilliant on so many levels. I love her funny Fortright style and the content of her shows is such a great support for those like myself on a quest to build a sense of self-worth and deal with issues related to diet culture and body peace. The world is lucky to have her and this podcast. Thank you so much. That just really blew me away and made me feel really good. So thank you so much, Liz App. I really appreciate you taking the time to leave the review all the way from Australia. And if you haven't already done so, you can leave a review for the show. Go to iTunes and search for Eat the Rules. Click ratings and reviews and then click to leave a review or give it a rating. If you haven't already done so, also get the free 10-day body confidence makeover at summerinandin.com forward slash freebies with 10 steps to take right now to feel better in your body. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to this show. Subscribe to this podcast via whatever platform you use. That helps other people to find the show. It helps to keep this podcast going for another year. And I just always appreciate it. And it helps you never miss an episode. If you missed last week's episode, I shared my personal journey in terms of healing my relationship with movement. That was episode 205. I'm starting to get confused by the numbers here because I'm in the 200s now. And I just every week I'm like, I have no idea what number episode this is. But that was episode 205. So you can check that out there. I received a lot of great feedback from some of you just saying that it was extremely relatable, that I was inside of your head, that it really helped you see that you can get to a good place where you have a healthy relationship with moving your body. And so today's episode, I'm going to give you eight ways to start to change our relationship with movement. Some of them are just some prompts for you to think of uh, about. Some of them are some actual things that you can do. Some of them are some mindset shifts that you can make. This actually started out as a list of five ways, and then it just kept getting bigger. And I felt like it could just keep getting bigger. And I, I might maybe do a follow up or add a different spin to it. But I cut it at eight for today. And we're going to go with that. <laughs> I just want to mention up front just a couple caveats here. Movement is not an obligation. You do not have to move your body. You are entitled to do whatever you want with your body. There is no morality associated with it. If you are in a space where you just need to rest, If that is the season of your life that you are in, then you just go for it and you do that and you listen to you and you listen to your body. And I also just want to acknowledge that when it comes to moving our bodies, there's so much privilege associated with that, whether that is accessibility or ability. There's just a lot of stuff that can prevent us from being able to move our bodies. And so I just want to acknowledge that here. And if you know you're not feeling these episodes, this isn't where you're at in your process or your journey, then just skip them. No big deal. 
I'd love to have you back when we're talking about something different in a couple weeks. All right, let's start out with today's episode, which is eight ways to change your relationship to movement. And I want to start by saying that the first thing to do is to really consider using the word movement. (laughs) So number one is see movement for what it is and consider using the word movement instead of exercise. I will start by just asking you a question, you know, what comes to mind when you think of the word exercise? What comes to mind when I say the word exercise? And then what comes to mind when I say the word movement? For most people, and maybe you're receiving this differently, which is 100% fine. But for a lot of people, you know, we see exercise as, okay, sweating, huffing and puffing, you know, doing something specific for a specific period of time, perhaps in a gym, perhaps using like certain, you know, equipment. Whereas when we think about movement, It really can open our mind to a lot of different things. It can be playing, it can be dancing, it can be having sex, it can be gardening, it can be doing housework, walking your dog. There's a lot of ways that we move our bodies throughout the day that we don't give ourselves credit for because it doesn't quote unquote count. And so the first way to really change your relationship with movement is to see movement for what it is, which is any kind of movement. It's not fitting it into a certain box. And to consider using the word movement instead of exercise, if you find that to be a word that makes you think of it in a very black and white way. The second way to change your relationship with movement is to stop letting your weight dictate your movement choices. If you are doing something because you're trying to make your body smaller and or you're afraid that it's going to get bigger, then that is a disordered relationship with exercise. Much like a disordered relationship with food is eating in a way that is either out of fear of your body getting bigger or in an effort to make your body smaller. And it's not to say that you're not going to have those thoughts creeping in. You're probably always going to have some of those thoughts around wanting to lose weight or a fear creep in once you've worked on healing your relationship with movement because that stuff takes a long time to go away. And we're swimming in the waters of a fat phobic and diet culture, culture, (laughs) diet oriented culture, where all of that stuff is continually being reinforced. And although we can unlearn this stuff, we can't always forget it. And so what I say to people is when someone comes to me and they say, hey, Summer, like I still, you know, have this voice telling me like I need to do this for weight loss or I need to do this for, you know, to kind of maintain my size. I will say to them like, okay, that voice is probably going to be there for a while. Our goal is to really try to minimize that voice, try to separate that voice from our own internal wisdom and what we know is best for our body. And over time, as you continue to do work, as you do work on accepting your body, then that voice does get quieter. And we hopefully get to a point where it's just sometimes a little bit more of a background voice versus something that's really dominant. And we're able to see it for what it is and just ignore it or shut it down and move on with our lives. And so in terms of something that you can do to really stop letting your weight dictate your movement choices, it really comes down to a simple question. And that question is, if your weight didn't matter, what would you do? Another way of asking this is, what would I do if my weight didn't matter? Or if my weight didn't matter, would I be doing this right now? I think I just said the same thing three times in a different variation. Pick the one that feels most relevant to you. But what we want to do is really get honest with ourselves. And so if we're out on a run, like if my weight didn't matter, would I be doing this right now? And you want to get honest with yourself about it. Or before you do something, if my weight didn't matter, would I choose this? And that's going to help you then decide, like, is that something you actually want to be doing? Or is that something that you feel like you should be doing based on diet culture, based on beliefs that you still hold about your body and yourself? And the more that we can separate ourselves from that, then the easier it's going to be, which leads to my third point here, number three, and that is to tune into what your body wants and how it feels versus doing what you think you quote unquote should do. So after you've kind of created that separation, if my weight didn't matter, what would I do? 
We want to try to get in touch with what our body needs, what we want and what our body needs, because we get really stuck up in our heads and we ignore the messages that our body is sending us. We listen to the shoulds. We think we should be doing something based on what we saw somebody else doing or based on what we used to do 10 years ago. Instead of meeting ourselves where we're at right now, which is really the process of acceptance. And a question to ask yourself is, what might feel good for my body? What do I want to do? What might feel good for my body right now? What do I need? What do I want to do? And you can even just like imagine yourself doing it and think, does this feel like, would this feel good? Does that sound appealing? Or am I getting kind of a visceral reaction to it of like, oh God, that's the last thing I want to do. Those are the types of things we want to be listening for. This is the same stuff that we do when we're healing our relationship with food. And now we're just kind of taking those things and really applying it to movement. And there are many different things that you can do to move your body. And so what you want to do is just try to tune into what feels best for you and start to focus on how you feel afterwards. So instead of thinking, oh, I didn't do enough. Think to yourself, how does my body feel right now? How do I feel? So an example of this is recently I had somebody say to me, I did yoga, but it didn't feel like it was enough. And I asked them, how did you feel? How did you feel afterwards? And they said, great, it felt really good. And I was like, can we just make that enough? Like, can that be our benchmark for success is like how you felt instead of this idea that it needs to fit into this box of what we believe is enough. We want to start to be more loyal to how things actually make us feel versus this bullshit narrative from diet and fitness culture and what we think we should be doing. Number four is to set non-weight or non-aesthetic related intentions and focus on connecting with those. A question I will generally ask people when I'm working with them around this is, what do you want to get out of movement? What do you want to get out of it? You know, what's your intention for doing it? Is it strength? Is it mobility? Is it fun? Is it energy? Is it better sleep? Is it coordination? Is it healing and injury? There are so many things that movement gives us that we ignore when we're only focused on our body size or how we look, or when we've equated these things like strength and mobility and endurance to a particular body size. It takes us away from actually seeing where we're moving towards those things. And so having clear intentions and really trying to connect with those things is going to help you stay focused on why you're really doing it and disassociate it from your weight and your body size. So setting those clear intentions can go a long way towards just reminding you of why you're doing it in the first place. Number five is to practice resting, taking time off, stopping, cutting it short, and really learning to adopt a good enough mentality around it. Perfectionism can show up in our movement a lot. Most of the people I work with have perfectionist tendencies. Perfectionism and body image go hand in hand. (laughs) And so one of the things that we need to really get over when we start to heal our relationship with movement is this idea that it has to look a certain way and that we have to do it X number of days for X amount of time, because all of that thinking is going to override our body. And it often also stops us from doing anything. So perfectionism can get in the way of us even moving our body to begin with, because we've set these unrealistic expectations. And then we realize like, oh, I don't have an hour, so I can't do it at all. Instead of thinking like, well, I can just do five minutes and that's going to be good enough for today. And so I highly recommend intentionally practicing imperfection. So not just like trying to, you know, maybe take rest when you feel you need rest, but almost like forcing yourself to like take some rest or take some time off or cut it short, like really tune in. If you're not enjoying something, give yourself permission to stop. If it feels too much for where you are today, then stop and to start with something that feels ridiculously doable and easy. So start with five minutes versus half an hour or an hour and just get comfortable with that because you can always, you can always do more, but we don't always need to. (laughs) And oftentimes we shouldn't be doing more. And if coming to this from a perspective of like having a lot of resistance towards moving your body, 
then I 100% recommend starting with something that just feels so ridiculously easy. Like, oh yeah, I can definitely do five minutes. That's fine. Then start with that. And let's just go from there. If you are coming to this from a place of like, I used to just do five days a week for an hour, and I feel like I need to get back to that, then you need to really practice cutting things short, resting, taking time off, and really just getting comfortable with whatever you've done being good enough. I wrote this blog post like a really long time ago about how I was going to go swimming one day. And I literally thought to myself, well, if I can't swim a mile, then like, I'm not going to go. <laughs> and which is just so ridiculous. And so it was through that where I realized like, wow, these perfectionist tendencies are holding me back from doing something that I actually want to do. And so I really forced myself to just go and just do the allotted time I had, which I think was like 15 minutes and just swim for 15 minutes. And that was enough. And I had to remind myself over and over, that is good enough. That was enough. And it was self-talk over and over and over to really lower the bar for myself and be content with that. Number six is to work on body acceptance. I put this one in the middle, but it could go at the end. It could go at the beginning. It's probably one of the most important things when it comes to fully healing your relationship with movement and food for that matter. When we are feeling cool in our body, then we don't have that, you know, that desire to manipulate it, which then dictates how we eat and how we move our body. When we work on accepting our body, we really become more in tune with what feels good for us. And we're able to do things from a place of care and respect and compassion versus discipline, punishment and shame, because nothing good comes from that. Um, I used this analogy yesterday when I was talking about acceptance with somebody. I was saying that because acceptance can kind of feel like a strange concept. We often associate it with, you know, letting ourselves go or giving up which could not be farther from the truth. Acceptance is really about meeting ourselves where we're at. So if you think about your relationship with a friend, or if you have a child, you're probably practicing acceptance with them all the time. So if they show up and they say like, hey, I'm really tired today. Do you mind if we just go out for a coffee instead of going out for the night? Or if you have a child that comes to you and says, mama, like, I'm just feeling kind of sad. I don't feel like doing that. You know, we respect that. And we would say, of course, honey, like, that's totally fine. Or we would say to our friend, like, of course, that's no problem. We accept other people for where they're at and who they are. And what acceptance really is, is about applying that same principle and value and intention to ourselves. And so when it comes to accepting our bodies, it's not about giving up or letting ourselves go. It's about accepting ourselves in the here and now and being in tune with what feels good for ourselves in the here and now and treating ourselves with care and respect in the same way that we would offer that to a close friend or a child or someone in our life. Hating your body is the catalyst to having a crappy relationship with movement and with food. And so healing that and getting to that place where you feel more neutral, where you can really treat yourself from a place of acceptance and know that you're good enough beyond your appearance is really critical to having a great relationship with movement. In my You on Fire program, one of the modules is about changing your relationship with movement, but it's later in the program because it is one of those things that I think we have to do this other work first in order to get ourselves to a place where we can really start to talk about changing our relationship with movement. So we work on the voice of our inner critic. We work on strengthening self-compassion. We work on unlearning beliefs, building up new beliefs about our bodies. We work on identifying our values. We work on overcoming judgments. We work on overcoming comparisons. And and we work on self care and all of these different things come before changing our relationship with movement, because I feel that we need to kind of have that foundation to truly be able to have success when it comes to healing our relationship with movement. Number seven, and this is kind of a similar to the previous point, and but that is to meet your body in the here and now. I think a lot of times we compare ourselves to what we used to do, or we compare ourselves to others, or we compare ourselves to what we think we should do. And we don't meet ourselves where we are at. We need to be with whatever body we have right now. So that means that if you are recovering from having a disordered relationship with movement, you need to be recovering. And that should be your primary intention and focus, not 
trying to get back to what you used to be able to do. If you had a serious physical injury, you wouldn't jump back into doing the same things you did before. And so it's the same thing when we talk about mentally recovering from having a disordered relationship with movement. We really have to ease ourselves back into it and hold back. If you are starting something again, if you haven't done something in a while, if you've been going through a period of rest or less movement or something in your life has made you need to slow down, then you need to really start with the body that you have that right now. And that might mean being really gentle with yourself and taking it easy. Like if you used to be able to go out and walk five miles, you might not be able to do that right now. So maybe you just go and you focus on just good walking for 10 minutes instead of trying to do what you used to do and then see how that feels. And you can gradually increase it from there. I find that sometimes it takes more effort to hold back than to push through. I find that with a lot of the people I work with, we're very achievement oriented, we are very perfectionist oriented, we're good at kind of pushing through. (laughs) And so it often takes more effort to hold back. And we need to be intentional about that. And then for people who have gone through a period where, you know, maybe their body has changed, or you haven't moved your body in a while, and you're expecting yourself to be able to do what you were able to do before, I think it's really important to set the bar really low. Again, just choose something that you know is going to be ridiculously doable for you. I cannot stress that enough to overcome that perfectionist mentality. We have to choose stuff. We have to lower that bar on ourselves. We may never be able to do what we did before. I'm not going to be able to do what I used to do before. I'm okay with that. It's important to feel emotions you have around that too and get to a place where you can make peace with that. And you may never be able to do what other people can do. That's okay too. Your body is different. Your abilities are different. And it's okay to feel things about that. And also, you know, try to work towards knowing that whatever you're doing is good enough for you and just being content with what you've done for yourself. You're the only one who needs to be proud of yourself. You're the only one that needs to give you validation to really feel that internally. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is to pick an environment that works for you. I find that if you come from gym culture or, you know, group fitness training, sometimes it's triggering to go back into that environment. You might be amongst people who make you feel like you need to be pushing yourself beyond what you can do or that you need to be dieting. Or maybe there's a ton of mirrors in the room. Like I can't stand places with mirrors in the room. And it's not that I don't mind seeing myself. It just, it takes me away from really tuning into like how things are feeling and makes me just sort of stare at myself, sort of like what happens when you're on Zoom. Like it's just, you know, doesn't feel that natural. And so if you're not digging it, then change it up. Find something that's better for you. I think that coming out of COVID, there are so many more online options now. And the guest experts that I am interviewing all have online classes, which I'll be telling you more about as I release those interviews over the next few weeks. But what's so great about that is that no matter where you are in the world, you're going to be able to access classes that are body positive and fat positive and inclusive and however you want to, you know, whatever language you want to use associated with that. Some of them all, they all use different language, to be honest. And so I think that that is what's really refreshing and gives you a new opportunity to find something where it's going to be better for you mentally. So if you're in an environment that feels really competitive, or you're comparing yourself to others, maybe that's not the best place for you right now. If everyone in your Zumba class is a size two, then maybe you want to try to find a more body positive Zumba class like Natasha Nagindi's class, who is the thick nutritionist who was on one of the episodes of the podcast. Yeah, she was on episode 179. I had to go and check that. I couldn't remember the number. But yeah, she has an incredible online Zumba class. I haven't done it, but I love watching her advertisements for I'm just not a Zumba person. Like that's just not going to happen. But if I was, I would 100% go because I'm like, she has the best energy. Anyways, so you can find different stuff that's going to fit and make you feel good mentally. Because I think that's another part of this is you want to be in an environment that feels good mentally for you. And I know that's not always possible. 
depending on what you have access to, or what you actually like to do. You know, you may really love a particular yoga class, but maybe everyone in the room is a size two, and there's mirrors everywhere. So I know it's not always possible. But and I do believe that we can work through the self doubt and comparative thoughts that come up. And when we're in an environment like that, so it doesn't mean you have to avoid those environments forever. But the bottom line is that it's important to just consider how things make us feel both physically and mentally versus just letting the voice of diet culture dictate what we think we should do. Okay, those are the eight ways to help you change your relationship with movement. I would love to know from you which one resonated most. You can let me know. You can DM me on Instagram and let me know. Or if you are on my email list, you can reply to the email when I send out this episode. But I'm super curious to know which one resonated with you. You can also let me know if you have any questions around movement because I've still got one more guest interview that I'm recording. And I may do another if I can. And I may do another solo episode if there's a bunch of questions that come in. So please do let me know if you have any questions around movement. I will be sure to ask the experts as well as answer them myself if I have any perspectives on them. I hope you're enjoying this series. And thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you listening. And I will talk to you soon. Rock on. I'm Summer Inanen, and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Summer Inanen. And if you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts, search Eat the Rules, and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on.